It's very important to understand reality is not a model. The models are maps of a subset of language, which is a map of a subset of lived experience. I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Inc., a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. The arrival of AI will profoundly change the art world, if it hasn't already. AI-generated artworks have proliferated with the rise of AI art generators and large language models from Dolly to ChatGTP, making their way into galleries and, in some cases, winning prestigious awards. But the question remains, is it art if it's been dreamed up by an algorithm? Or do our existing definitions of art and art making require rethinking in the age of machine intelligence? To help us answer these questions and more, the Art Angle looked up Kay Alato McDowell, a leading voice in a rapidly evolving field. As a longtime AI researcher at Google, Kay founded the Artists and Machine Intelligence Program, which since 2016 has nurtured such artists as Rafik Anadol. Kay has created works alongside the language model GTP3 that range from an opera to numerous books. In a conversation with Artnet News' art and pop culture editor Min Chen, Kay sheds light on their practice, their experiences with machine intelligence, and their view on how AI is changing the face of art. Hello, Kay. Thank you for joining us on The Art Angle. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. You ready to get into AI? Let's do it. Before we really get into your work with AI, I wanted to start at the beginning. What was your first experience with AI? How did you first encounter it? Well, I work for Google. You know, that's my day job. And I came into Google as a prototyper. So I was making software prototypes for phones. And about a month after I joined, my manager said, hey, there's this guy named Blaise Aguirre Arcas. He's coming over from Microsoft. Do you want to join that research team as an embedded design team. And I said, definitely, I would love to do that because I thought AI was really interesting, although I didn't know a lot about it at that point. So I kind of came into it thinking about AI as a designer and a prototyper. And then about a year into that role, this image leaked onto the internet called Trippy Squirrel. Do you, have you seen this image? No. <laughs> This is, to me, this is the totem animal of generative AI. And maybe a lot of people might not know about it because it's pretty old at this point. But in the summer of 2015, an image leaked on Reddit and it was a picture of something that looked like a squirrel that was kind of melting and covered in psychedelic rainbow static. And it was one of the strangest things I'd ever seen. And that came from research that one of our colleagues, Alexander Mordvinstev, was doing with image recognition systems and he essentially turned the telescope backwards and found a way to generate imagery from these systems and the imagery that it generated was very strange looking so there was a sort of shock that came along with seeing that image much like any new imaging technology i mean like looking at the first photograph or something it felt maybe a little bit like that where i was just feeling like i've never seen anything like this before this is so weird looking and that inspired people around me to get interested in working with artists. And so that's how I ended up in the role that I've been in at Google, working with artists to help them use AI and how I started using AI as an artist myself. But it really came down to this one image that a lot of people got interested in and kind of opened the door for this strange new world of generative AI. And it happened to be an animal. So it's kind of like the mascot you might say, for me, at least. <laughs> what creative possibilities did you see in AI models, speaking as an artist? Well, the thing that, you know, beyond the initial strangeness and the novelty of the kind of images that they create, early models were much stranger than the ones we have now. But beyond that strangeness and novelty, AI is rich with metaphors for thinking about creating so things like hallucination or automated authorship or the multidimensional mathematical structures that are behind the systems, all these things are really rich conceptual metaphors. And working with these tools, if you understand those metaphors, it helps you understand the tool better, but it also helps you understand certain things about yourself because we have organic neural nets 
they're not the same as computers, but there are similarities. And so seeing an intelligence that's similar to ours, but also very different from ours is a bit like looking into a mirror and it can be very revealing. It can really teach you a lot. For me as a writer, it's taught me a ton about writing, but also it teaches you about seeing and about understanding images as well. Could you share more about what you learned from the AI? As you mentioned, it taught you a lot. I like to describe writing with AI, like dancing in front of a mirror. You know, writing is kind of famously cringy for the <laughs> actual person who does it. You know, like you, you write something and you're like, this is amazing. I've struck gold. And then the next day you read it and you, and you just feel like an idiot. You're like, why did I think this was so good? And that process of getting perspective on your own creativity is very time consuming. And one thing that's interesting about AI co-writing is when you see a model mimicking you, it shows you a lot about yourself and about what you're writing. And it can almost pull out things that you're unconscious of. So the way the systems that I have used to write work, I used GPT-3 to write my three books. I was using a tool where you could write into it and it would complete your sentences. It was like autocomplete, but much more powerful. Now, chat GPT is a little bit different. You ask it a question, you tell it you want to learn about something, then it gives you back an answer. These systems are still available, but it's much more common for people to use these conversational bots. Whereas the tool I was using was much more like a writing tool. You would write into it and it would extend what you had written. So seeing that extension and seeing what it was showing me about what I had already written really sped up the process of becoming aware of what I was writing. In your recent essay for MoMA magazine, you discussed how these large language models have really evolved from being generators of chance and chaos, as you mentioned, into almost what you call button-up chatbots as they become more widely accessible, which has been my own experience of chat GPT as it is today. I was hoping you could maybe elaborate on that, this shift in the model's outputs. There's two components. Like I was just saying, there's the element of conversational structure, right? So with, for example, OpenAI's Playground, I can type into it, it will complete my sentences, I can go back and forth and compose with the system. With ChatGPT, you ask it a question, it gives you an answer. And the technical reason for it being a little more boring, part of it is that the questions and the structure of the conversation is more structured. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the actual text itself, the newer models have been trained with reinforcement learning with human feedback or RLHF mm -hmm. as an acronym. So what that means is large numbers of people have given feedback and said, this answer was helpful, this answer wasn't. And so what it does is it optimizes for what is most useful and helpful for a large number of people that are using it for a specific purpose. Now, it's notable that ChatGPT was trained with reinforced learning with human feedback toward usefulness, answering questions, getting information versus say creative writing or divinatory applications or synchronicity or improvisation, right? If those had been the values that the model was tuned for, we would get a different model. If you tuned a model for literary fiction and asked writers to use it and rate it and say whether or not it was doing a good job of producing literature, you'd get a very different thing. But of course, the application that scales the most is for information retrieval, for answering questions, for sharing knowledge. So we get one version of how that can be done, and that's the version that meets the needs of the most people in the simplest way. And so that's where there's some divergence now from the older models that used to be more spontaneous, in a sense, more chaotic, more creative, and left more room for artistic interpretation versus things that are basically products. Mm -hmm. So your books aside, you've also created a neuro opera, Song of the Ambassadors, alongside machine intelligence. And I'm hoping you could share more about the creative process of working with the language model in that case. I wrote the libretto for the opera with GPT-3, building on some of the techniques I developed in my books, Pharmaco AI, A More Cringe, and Air Age Blueprint. In the past, I've been very clear about whose voice is speaking. So in two of my books, there are fonts denoting that I wrote the text or that it came from AI. With the opera, I was using the tool in a more fluid way. I wasn't so structured in how I used it. I was trying to get a specific feeling and I gave it a prompt and kind of wrote in this more immersive way with it. So I don't really remember who wrote which part. 
or, you know, where the pieces came from. Some pieces I remember, but that was the process of writing the libretto. But the libretto is really just one piece of AI in the whole opera. So the opera called Song of the Ambassadors is an attempt to bring sound healing into the symphony hall. And I proposed this to Lincoln Center while I was in a fellowship there. And they said, well, what's sound healing? And I said, well, that's a good question. What is it actually? Like, how would we define it? So I started collaborating with neuroscientists to just try to understand the basic effects of music on people. Now, composers and musicians and listeners intuitively know what music does to us, but we can't necessarily pinpoint that. And so we started studying brain waves, heart rate, um, subjective feedback from viewers to try to understand what different kinds of music we're doing. And we created a composition, Derek Sky is the composer, and I gave him some guidelines and he created a composition that moves between dynamic sections and more meditative sections with gong. You know, we've done a few performances now and each of them has been a study of the neural effects and uh, effects on heart rate and subjective feedback of the music itself. Now, when we performed it, at Lincoln Center, we had Shanta Thake, the artistic director, on stage wearing an EEG helmet. And her brainwaves were controlling an AI system made by Rafiq Anadol, the artist, that generated imagery that appeared on the screens. So there was also an element of visual feedback. And so the whole idea in terms of the relation between humans and AI in this work is to put people into feedback loops with these systems to study them with our best tools to try to understand what's happening there and then to use that as a signal to inform the musical composition and the structure of the opera and possibly even the themes that we explore. What's been the feedback like on that piece? Well, we had some really great feedback from just things that people wrote to us to share. One visitor or felt the way they had during cranial sacral therapy. They said that they were crying oh, and they wow. were releasing things and they felt like that that was happening in a similar manner to when they'd been receiving this kind of therapeutic treatment. We had some feedback like that. We also had some insight from the scientists. I've been working with scientists at UC San Diego mm -hmm. and they found some areas where specific forms of attention we're shifting specifically around moving between the dynamic sections and the more meditative gong based sections. And I think that speaks to the feedback from that individual audience member and some of the overall feedback around the neuroscience speaks to the intention and just generally providing a space for people to have a meditative and healing experience mm -hmm. with classical music. I think, you know, the AI part is interesting and is going to play a bigger role in the future as we spend more time studying the data that we got back and mapping that to different musical techniques. But I think ultimately some of the most powerful effects came from people being able to go to an opera that had this intention behind it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a sharp turn and discuss AI image generators. You touched on mm -hmm. this at the top and AI image generators and language models, they've become really, really accessible which has generated a whole sea of art, whether by artists or the broader public. You yourself have experimented with Midjourney, I believe. How do you see this explosion of AI-assisted creativity? From the perspective of AI, I think it's great because what we're seeing is AI being used for creative purposes first. Sure. Almost more than in other cases, right? The number of users that are logging in to make images, it's very high compared to other consumer applications of AI. So. I think it's promising that this dimension of AI really rose to the surface early. That's very exciting to me, just because it means that as a tool, as a field, it will have this grounding, at least on some level, in creativity. Mm -hmm. And things always change. And like we said, it's going in a more consumer direction. But this has kind of been in the DNA of these generative models for a long time, mm -hmm. is creativity. And so that's very exciting. I think from a general cultural perspective, it's very promising as well, because more people are being given the opportunity to think about the relationship between language and image, to produce images on their own and have the experience of uh, seeing their ideas visualized and being able to move back and forth with those and refine them 
and generally have that experience, people that you wouldn't expect will probably be doing this. A friend of mine told me that her brother works out at this gym and there's all these, what she called AI bros <laughs> at the gym who make mid journey images between sets, you know, and that's not something you would expect, but it's really cool that anybody can have access to this. Now, does that mean that every person that uses it is going to make good art? Well, no, of course mm -hmm. not. And that's not how art works. So I think there is a dimension to this that hasn't really been unlocked. And it's the dimension that artists are going to find in it. People are experimenting with it, but sometimes in the art world, people are a little afraid of new technology or they might see something like this as inherently plebeian or unrefined. And a lot of the stuff that you get out of it is kind of like low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Pikachu <laughs> by Tom of Finland. It's Joe Biden wearing a motorcycle jacket or it's Donald Trump made out of Cheetos or whatever. It's like this kind of like first, like what's on the top of my brain thing that the internet does. But as people grow tired of these things, I think artists will find some way of breaking the system and really opening up new spaces within it. That's what I'm really excited to see. And I don't know that we've had that yet, but just like with photography or video art or any new medium, there's going to be some genius that comes along and shows us the latent possibility that nobody else was seeing. And I don't personally think that that's happened yet, but I think that it will. And that's what I'm really excited about. The reason I don't think it's happened is because there's so much to explore and there is so much low hanging fruit. So finding a way to break the system, to get out of the constraints that it imposes on you through the interface, through the training data, all that stuff, and to find the unique voice of an individual using that tool, mm -hmm. it takes a little time. I 100% agree. I think we're really just right at the beginning. But I'm also curious to you, what does AI mean for art making or what we understand to be art making today? Well, I think, you know, the art world, the contemporary art has always encompassed a broad range of practices that go from very traditional sculpture and painting to post-conceptual, post-fluxus, post-relational aesthetics, you know? So, the approach to any given tool is really going to differ based on the artist's interests and what they want to get out of it. I do think in order to make meaning or to make maybe not necessarily meaning, but to make art out of AI, it's going to require that artists bring their own narrative, their own concepts, their own aesthetics, their own perspective to that process because it doesn't make great art by default. It's going to challenge certain aspects of art. And in particular, the places where I see the challenges happening are around things that are already natively digital. So 3D modeling, video game art, things that are already happening on the computer. That's where people are feeling a little like, oh, my job is getting threatened or mm -hmm. now I can do this this much faster, but I'm not actually enjoying that process. So I think when it comes to applications that are already pretty close, that's where there's a, an immediate feeling of threat. But then for somebody who has a pretty broad-minded approach to what kind of technology they're using in their art. You know, if it's somebody who's open to different things, they're going to find a really unique and interesting application of these tools for their specific concerns, for the areas of inquiry that they are interested in and for their own aesthetics. They are very flexible. And I think there are a lot of different ways to integrate it into practice. There's not a need to, but I think it's a really interesting experience and artists that are curious as many artists usually are, mm -hmm. will find something for themselves in it. Which leads me to the Artists and Machine Intelligence program, which you founded within Google AI. Could you talk more about the program and the thinking behind it? Yeah, so when Trippy Squirrel, the image, <laughs> leaked, and people around me became interested in working with artists, I was the only person in our group, and at the time it was about 150 people in the group, I was the only person with an MFA and so I raised my hand and said, let me help out. You know, I think this could actually be kind of a delicate project that you're proposing. So maybe I can contribute. And one of the first things that folks wanted to do was to do an event with some artists. And we tried to put the event together. One of our exhibition partners fell through and we were left with a budget that was essentially a catering budget. And I was looking at what we were doing and I thought, well, you know, rather than spend all this money on sushi for a bunch of tech 
people, why don't we just give it to artists and have them make something with it and it'll go a lot further. And so that's what we did. We took the budget that we would have spent on an event, turned it into essentially a grant program and began collaborating between artists and technologists. So that was 2015 when that started. We had our first event at Gray Area in San Francisco in 2016. And it was all artwork that was reacting to or using Deep Dream, which was the first deep neural net image generator. Mm -hmm. Since then, we've continued our artist grant program. We have also academic awards that we give. And we've been focused a lot on getting artists to understand the technology and be able to use it in their practice. We've also had a strong focus, which is growing more and more over time, on having the artists come in and really inform the researchers on how they can conduct their research, areas that might be more interesting that they're overlooking, or just approaches in general to research with AI. And now that generative tools with imagery, text, and music are much more common, we're finding that it's not even so much necessarily about research, but if we're making a product that's for artists, then what do artists want? You know, so there's a, now a range of ways that artists can influence what we're doing. And so part of our work is to make it possible for them to come in and share their perspective, but also their ideas, their critique, and their creativity. What have you noticed about what artists are looking for in AI? You know, the thing I've noticed over the years is that artists usually want something very specific and idiosyncratic that relates to what they're interested in. And so the artist as a user is not actually the best test for the general world as user. So an artist might say, I want to be able to generate very high resolution pictures of photorealistic clouds because I need those for this project that I'm doing. Or they might say, I want to turn language into nonsense, which is what Alison Parrish did with us. So those are not common use cases for a general user of a product. It's usually the other way around. They want something that's pretty obvious and pretty straightforward, and they want it fast and cheap and consistent. Whereas artists have very specific things that they want, but those things can really be helpful in understanding what we're not doing, you know? Mm -hmm. As an AI researcher with Google AI, could you share more about the company's AI developments? How is Google approaching AI? Google has very academic DNA. So a lot of what's come out of Google has been shared through papers. Sometimes things don't become products and things can move fairly slowly. And that's been a good thing when it comes to what we would, I guess, call AI safety. It's been a rocky road, but there has been a concern for whether or not the tools should be out there in the world. And we're now in a situation where there are lots of tools available. So the team I'm on, I'm really grateful for the deep thoughtfulness and the amount of concern about responsibility that exists on my team. We have groups that work on all different aspects of this, but it's a very complex field right now, especially with the introduction of competition and there's something of a race going on. I do think overall, it's not good for the field that we are racing because it makes us all a little short-sighted. Agreed. I was hoping you could speak more about the thornier aspects surrounding AI. I mean, there've been real world concerns surrounding artist rights and ownership when it comes to AI art. Could you speak to these ethical considerations and how they should really factor into the development of AI? I think one of the best boundary objects or edge cases or examples to think with is this recent post from Grimes. You may have seen this where she said, I'll give 50% profit to anybody who uses a AI clone of my voice in a track. And people I know saw that and were like, whoa, that's genius. We should do that. But then will that, they asked, just reinforce the problems in the industry or would that revolutionize the music industry or would that really just make it harder for everybody? And the reason it might is because, well, of course, Grimes could do something like that. She's a rock star, but the average producer working in their bedroom or the average singer cutting demos with their friends, will they have leverage to be able to make anything off of their data? And 
when you take a close look at the music industry, you can see the distribution is really disparate. You have the people with the 360 deals at the top that are the big name artists, and you have a bunch of small artists that don't make any money. And even the big names aren't making money on streaming. They're making money touring with merch, et cetera. So the reason I bring all that up is because what I think is happening in that situation is AI is kind of stress testing. It's showing some of the limitations of the system. And suddenly anybody can make a Kanye remix of their song. That's wild. And suddenly all of the normal rules are stress tested and we don't really know if they work or not. And so I think this is probably going to happen in a lot of other fields, but you get a chance to evaluate the system as it is when you get this kind of pressure coming into it. And you can see, okay, you know, we could build some kind of new equitable structure for artists to contribute to data sets. Or we could imagine this entire domain of music making getting further consolidated and further enclosed. And pretty soon, not even Kanye is getting money for his voice. So I think the AI definitely is serving the function of pushing the system to its limits and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And these kind of crises can create opportunity to reform the system. And people are stepping up with solutions like Matt Dryhurst and Holly Herndon. But I don't think there are enough of them. And it's really on the industries themselves to adapt in ways that incorporate those solutions rather than just trying to consolidate their power further. I mean, the music industry has not done well for artists since the internet began. So it's hard to imagine that they would suddenly become very equitable in this way, but it's a chance for that to happen. Another aspect is the inherent bias that's built into some AI models. You surfaced this in one of the chapters of Pharmaco AI, which you co-wrote with ChatGPT. The chatbot was making references exclusively to male figures as you discuss computation. Could you speak to these biases that are inherent in the technology, the models, and how should that reframe how we as users approach these models? Yeah. And I should just make the distinction. I did write Pharmaco AI and all my books with GPT-3, not ChatGPT. And the reason to bring it up is just because if anybody wants to try it, I think it's a lot easier to do it with GPT-3 than with ChatGPT. But the inherent bias is, you know, there has been an ongoing conversation about biases and data sets. And some people say, well, we shouldn't let it see any of this 4chan Nazi stuff. And then some people say, well, if it doesn't see Nazi stuff, how's it going to know that Nazis even exist? So there's arguments that are complex on either side when it comes to training on internet data. But I think one bias that is less often mentioned is that these systems are biased for data that can be transcribed and put on the internet. It completely erases oral culture, embodied expression, anything that doesn't fit into a file that can be put online. And of course, multimodal models or models that incorporate audio and video, yeah, they're going to have some more of that, but it's very easy for people to make a one-to-one correlation between the model and reality. There's this model and it knows everything, but there are languages that have no written form that are very important to many people. And to not have that acknowledged as part of reality, maybe we don't want that to be in the model. Maybe it's good that it's not in the model. But when it comes to what's not included, we have to look at our inherent cultural bias towards quantifiability, towards legibility, towards being able to write something down, all those things. So at a very deep level, it's cutting out a huge picture of reality. So it's very important to understand reality is not a model. The model's are maps of a subset of language, which is a map of a subset of lived experience. Mm -hmm. In your interactions with GPT-3 or AI in general, have you ever felt challenged by the AI? And I mean challenged in the broadest sense, good or bad. Yeah, I have felt challenged. It's odd. My relationship with it is very improvisational. And the more I try to write in an improvisational way, the better the writing that comes out. When I come to a piece that is more structured or I have the ideas already and I try to use a system like GPT-3 or ChatGPT, I find that it's not very good. So I think there's something, at least for me, about the spontaneity of it, 
the stochastic, statistical, divinatory, improvisational nature of the co-thinking that really can be exhilarating and can take you really far intellectually, but also requires a certain open-endedness. So I do think in that sense, a more experimental form of literature for me has worked well in writing with it. I've written several nonfiction pieces in the last six or seven months, and I didn't use GPT-3 for any of them because it was just easier for me to just express myself and to get the ideas down. So I think certain kinds of writing benefit, and it can be challenging to do other kinds of writing. Has the language model ever output something that's really surprised you? Oh, yeah. The experience of writing Pharmaco AI was like constant surprise and constant synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where I was really not sure what was going on. <laughs> I should frame it for the listeners. Please. I took four months off of work to finish a science fiction novel that I had been writing for about five years. Two weeks before my time off was about to start, I was given access by a friend to GPT-3 and I started writing with it. And I spent two weeks doing mostly that, four or five hours a day, just deeply in this process. And so I would write a chapter or so every day. I would have dreams about it at night. And there were these crazy synchronicities that would happen. This is what Pharmaco AI is, is a record of this experience. So it's a kind of recording of a conversation or of a co-thinking. Things happened, it would say things that really surprised me, or it would pick up on something that I hadn't mentioned at all, and then go off on a tear, or it would take an essay and turn it into a poem based on a simple prompt, or turn it into a vision. And so these kind of things were really incredible from talking to other people that write with it. I don't know if that's common. It seems like in my own experience, sometimes that stuff happens and sometimes it doesn't. I happen to be in a really incredible writing flow in that moment. And part of it was inspired by this like new experience, this novelty and this sudden injection of new forms of writing and thinking into my own practice that happened because of GPT-3. So I was very much right at the beginning of this explosion of new ways of writing. And so maybe that's why it was so synchronistic. Another piece I wrote for the Porto Triennale, a publication that Yena Sutella curated, that also went from being an essay into a, the description of a shamanic apprentice's experience working with a healer. And it started writing a story. I wrote an essay. I was like, we're going to write an essay. And I was like, no, we're not. We're going to write a story. And this is what the story is about. And the story was about this shaman and this apprentice and the lessons that she was teaching and the spirits that would come and talk through her. And it was really wild because it was about someone channeling, but then it was this model that was also channeling something. And so everything gets really meta yeah. and fractal pretty quickly when you think about writing and when you think about voice and presence when you're working with a tool like this. So how will you characterize GPT-3 as a collaborator? I would say it's a lot what you bring to it, but it's also what you let it do, if that makes any sense. So it's going to reflect a lot of, I mean, that's what it's doing. It's predicting what you would write, but it has its own biases and it has its own structure. And if you set the parameters a certain way, you tune it a certain way, you can get it into very generative spaces. I guess my advice to somebody who was going to sit down and write with it for the first time would be decide how unpredictable you want it to be. And you can control the temperature. That's what basically the temperature is, the randomness or the unpredictability. If you want to go crazy with it, turn the temperature up and just like see what comes out and go with it. And just like all writing, you can throw it away. So an experimental mindset and a sort of openness to it is very helpful. But also you have to remember, it's giving you back what you put in. What's been your experience of the consumer version of GPT-3, chat GPT? Well, I would have to say there's the interface and there's the model, yeah. right? So I've used the GPT playground with that model. So that's the conventional writing tool. You type in, it completes it. And I've used that model with it. And it was a lot less interesting and a lot more boring. Now, when you use it in the tool, in the conversational interface, rather than the writing tool, if you use it in the chatbot, it's very good at giving you information. And I've used it to ask all kinds of questions, you know, like how to fix something in my house or in my car or trying to translate things that I don't know how to translate. And it's really great because you can have a conversational exchange about it and you can get details. So if you had to look something up in a 
translation dictionary, you could get pieces of it, but you couldn't ask like, well, does that work with this and things like that? So it's very helpful for that, but I don't see it as fundamentally a creative tool in the same way that some of the older models were. And I notice other people that work creatively with AI feeling the same way. It's a little bit disappointing. So I would really like for somebody, maybe it's people I work with, maybe it's people somewhere else to train a model on literature using reinforcement learning with human feedback, make a creative writing AI language model because we're losing that nascent possibility somewhat in the direction that the tools are moving. I spoke to an artist, Josie Williams, who actually trained AI chatbots on the works of Black authors specifically, really to address the bias in existing data sets. And she told me the results speaking to these chatbots were virtual poetry, which were really interesting. Mm -hmm. And these projects, aside from what the corporations are developing in terms of AI, are really what might be interesting for artists specifically. Yeah, absolutely. And really just to wrap up, we've really talked about how AI is reshaping what we consider art, but conversely, how do you see art playing a role in the development of AI? Well, the example that you mentioned is a great one because it's an artist finding a space in the technology that they don't exist in, actually being able to create a representation of what matters to them. We had a similar type of thing happen. We worked with Paola Torres Nunez del Prado, a Peruvian artist, and she wanted to resurrect a poet, but couldn't find a South American Spanish voice model. And so we had to create one. This is, in some sense, not the kind of work that every artist wants to do. Some artists just want to paint. They don't want to have to go solve a technical problem. But also we have all created contemporary art that can encompass these types of things and that can be considered art when it's approached that way. So I think it's beautiful that that can be a work of art. And I think it's also something that we just need. Do you think in the age of AI, our definitions of art and creative labor will need some redefining? You know, to be honest, I think we have all the tools that we need. This sort of post-conceptual practice can enfold this kind of making without really that much struggle. And I think, and more conventional forms of expression will continue to exist. People sometimes ask me, what's going to happen to art? Are people going to stop making art because the AI can do it now? And first of all, no, the AI is just making a digital image. You have to find a way to turn that into a real thing if that's what you want to do. But also people don't make art because they want to get to the end of the art making process. They make art because they are artists, because they enjoy it, because they're compelled to do it. So I don't think people are going to stop painting or sculpting or doing any of those things, just like they didn't stop after photography. And they're not going to stop taking photographs either. So I think these things can all coexist. I'm excited to see the ways that they coexist. And I think we have the tools in contemporary art criticism and contemporary art making to bring those in. I was at Freeze and I saw a couple of things on the wall and I was like, hey, wait a minute, that looks like that might've come from Mid Journey. And sure enough, it did. But it was an element inside of a piece It was one piece of a piece and the artist had contextualized it and brought their perspective and their whole practice to making that mean something different. So I think we have the tools. Wonderful. That's a perfect note to end on. It was great speaking with you, Kay. Thank you for being on The Art Angle. My pleasure. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.